So uh, my name is Eric Connor, the Dean of Students in New York Film Academy. A couple of quick little housekeeping things. One, they keep trying to get me to push the sandwiches. The sandwiches, y'all look very thin and hungry, so eat them. Uh, there are drinks, stay hydrated, it's 195 degrees in the valley. Uh, there's other drinks that will maybe dehydrate you a little more. Our friends over at Deep Eddy, flavored vodka. And uh, after this panel, there is a party at the W Hotel, right down the street here on Hollywood Boulevard, starts at 9 o'clock. Uh, your passes should get you in there. Uh, now, our, our, our speaker here said, don't even tell them where I'm from. Don't say anything about me. So I'm gonna just point to that banner, but I'm not gonna say where she's from or what company she works in. Uh, but I will say, guys, this panel here, I described it as like the greatest playlist I could imagine of Hollywood. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to the mysterious Nicole Green. <laughs> Thank you. Hands that rock. Oh, uh, Final Draft, thank you for sponsoring this. And Hands That Rock, free massage, well, not free massages. The reason we price massages for donation, for a good cause, they're right here afterwards, so enjoy. And back to you. And she's really, really sweet. And also a big shout out to Holly Schwartz, because without them, we would not be here. I'm from a company called Indie.com. Now we actually, hey, we created our company because we love, we love artists. And we're getting so discouraged because so many artists just aren't making it these days, not because they're not good, they're not even getting seen. We're like, we need to do something about this. So we did. We do a whole bunch of different things, but one of the main things that we do is we do a whole bunch of different competitions that we call challenges. They're for actors, for singers, for poets, name, I mean, literally, name an art form, we do competitions for that. But we get big, huge celebrity judges, uh, and people win prizes like parts in TV shows, and parts in movies, and meetings like with people in some of the panels here, two of them have already been prizes already. Uh, people also win record deals and $50,000 in marketing for their career, like it really is insane. And it is 100% free to submit your work and you retain ownership of all of your material. So I'm very excited today because these are some of my favorite people. Not only are they at the very, very top of their game, but just cool as hell and I love them. Um, and I will not be moderating today. I'm actually going to pass it off to Jim Meskimen because he's even better at it than I am. Um, so please welcome Jim. He, you'll recognize him from Parks and Recreation. He and his wife are part of a founding team um, for the Acting Center, which any of you actors out there at the school is amazing. You have to go. Um, he's also producing and starring in Impress Me, which is also co-produced by Ray Wilson from The Office. So everybody, hands together. Thank you. Just to clarify, uh, this is my wife's school, the Acting Center. I'm just a sympathizer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sometimes get credited as being the founder, but it's not true. Anyway, who cares, right? Uh, we've got a wonderful panel here, the really extraordinary people, and so I want to get right into it. Uh, but first, before I get right into it, I want to find out who we have here in the audience. So uh, uh, raise your hand if you are an aspiring writer. Okay, sit down then. And uh, raise your hand if you're an aspiring actor or actress. Good. And raise your hand if you're an aspiring director. Good. And raise your hand if you're just not aspiring to do anything. <laughs> okay, good. So we have some idea of who we're, we're talking to and stuff like that. So that's great. And, and, and basically this is set up, and what Nicole has set this up basically is a, a forum to try to share what they call best practices or tips or whatever for people who are starting out, who are beginners, who are struggling. Which, uh, you know, I think even if you've been in show business a long time, you feel like you're still struggling. My mother's an actress, Marion Ross of Happy Days, and she says, you know, you never really feel like you're in this business. <laughs> she says that. At 86 years old, and, uh, you know. People used to call my house looking for your mother. <laughs> Was she ever there? No. Huh? That's one of life's cruelties. Anyway, let me introduce this Marsha Ross, who you just heard from. In her more than 30 years as an award winning casting director and a studio executive, Marsha Ross has been involved in the casting of hundreds of successful feature films, network series, pilots, movies for television, and miniseries. She now heads Marsha Ross Casting. And recently, cast parental guidance with Billy Crystal, Beth Midler, and Marissa Tomei, Oblivion, with a guy named Tom Cruise, and somebody named Morgan Freeman, and Small Time with Christopher Maloney and Dean Norris, plus several network pilots. Uh, she had a career at the Walt Disney Company and Warner Brothers TV, and uh, she's introduced uh, such new talent. 
they were new at the time, as Heath Ledger, Anne Hathaway, Chris Pine, Rachel McAdams, Paul Rudd, Brittany Murphy, Amy Poehler, Megan Fox, and Jennifer Garner. She is the recipient of the 2002 Hollywood Film Festival Award for Outstanding Achievement in Casting. And for 16 years, Marcia served as the EVP of casting for Walt Disney Studios Motion Picture Group. Prior to joining that, she worked as an independent casting director and as the vice president of casting and talent development for Warner Brothers Television. Give her a hand. <laughs> next to her, next to her is, is the decorated Robert Munich. And he is an Emmy and PGA Award nominated writer, director, and producer with over 18 pilots sold to network and cable. Munich is currently serving as co-executive producer and writer on the Fox's hit Empire. Uh, he helped launch A&E's first dramatic series, The Cleaner, starring Benjamin Bratt, which he co-created. And other TV credits include uh, Fox's Gang Related and TNT's Murder in the First. Some of his film credits include Fighting, No True Glory, The Battle of Fallujah, Double Take, and The Season for director-producer McGee. He wrote and directed the Showtime movie in a class of his own and was nominated for an Emmy Award for writing and won the award for excellence from the National Television Review Board, Robert Munich. <laughs> and next to me, uh, Walter O'Brien is the chief executive officer and founder of Scorpion Computer Services. And the basis, I guess the company and also the individual, is the basis for the hit CBS TV show, Scorpion. With an IQ of 197, just to say, you know, he's got some smarts, and he's now created a think tank of geniuses for hire that provides intelligence on demand as a concierge service for funded challenges through concierge.up.com. Through that company, he not only consults for military and government matters, He's also working with multiple studios on multiple projects and is on the advisory board of Indie.com. Give him a hand. So I have some questions. The other questions will come up and then we will have uh, towards the end Q&A so you get to ask your own personalized questions. And when that happens, I forgot to ask, but will there be a, a microphone for people to go to or do they just stand up and shout it out? You know? It's such a small room. We'll just have you come up and sit on our laps. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to pose this, uh, I think, to Robert first. Uh, to, you know, to talk about the, the, the things that help creative people get noticed in, as you're a writer, a director, and were you ever an actor? Probably I, I was an actor for a long time. Yeah. In fact, uh, when I came to LA, I came out here to be an actor. Didn't know anyone, didn't have any connections in Hollywood. Um, ended up sleeping on a couch of a friend of a friend of a friend who was a production accountant. Um, ended up getting an agent and worked as an actor for five years. And then segued from that into writing and directing and producing. Okay, well, I just want to know if you're an actor. This is a oh, specific sorry. question. <laughs> <laughs> Where you want? Good actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. nice um, yeah, I was an actor. Okay, splendid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking that it might be helpful if we're looking at, when we're really looking at how to think outside the box, and we hear this expression thinking outside the box all the time. And I thought it would be useful to know, what is this box, first of all? So when you uh, first came to town, and when you first started on this, what did the box look like that you were trying to think outside of, or fit into? Well, I never wanted to fit in, and I think that's kind of why I continue to move outside it and just move the parameters of the box. So, and you, you've been in this business, you've grown up in this business, and you've seen how much it's changed. It used to be very traditional. We were just speaking about this. Um, but now, there's so many platforms for actors to be discovered because the opportunity is out there to create their own content. Whereas when we were doing it, your picture had to be sent in, you had to go through casting. Now, the, the platform has changed and the, the paradigm has shifted so much that I'm finding actors for TV shows online and bringing them in and putting them on television because my kids are sending me clips of these performers, and the next thing you know, we're casting them as series regulars. Awesome. And it's all internet-based, and I think that's the biggest change that's going on right now, is that's knocked all four corners off the box. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. yeah. 
totally agree. And Marsha, your, your job has obviously changed a lot with this digital revolution. Yeah. What did it look like in the beginning when you started? What was the, what was the typical way that business was done that you were trying to, to master? Well, I mean, it was much better for actors in a lot of ways. I mean, and I think what Robert's saying, though, and I'll get to that in a second, about the internet and getting your work seen, but there were a lot less actors out there. Um, and we, as casting directors, also didn't have the whole world to look at because we didn't have the internet bringing us talent from all around the world. Actors could have representation a lot easier because there were a lot more talent agencies and so they would take on new people and they would develop talent and and they did, weren't worried about the fact that the actor didn't have any traction anywhere. They used their relationships with cast and directors to get them in the door. You read actors. Everything wasn't done on videotape. You know, you read an actor, you brought an actor for to the director and producer. There were things called callbacks and more callbacks, and people took notes. And decisions were made about what a person could do in the room, not alone in a little room with a tape in a little tiny closet of an office with a casting associate and a camera. So it's it's that's primarily how it's changed for me is that the, the, the internet has in many ways opened my eyes to actors around the world and it's also again introduced me to actors I wouldn't see any other way. Um, but it's made it so much harder for actors to, 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 break, to break through. And to, just to add one thing, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in um, just really realizing that everything's an opportunity. I mean, to, uh, sort of a healthy opportunism as I call it. You know, it's not a bad word to look at everything as an opportunity, the encounters, the people that you meet. Because you don't know if you meet another actor and you do some their web series and their agent sees that web series that then they see you. It's, it's every step you go, really keeping yourself open to every single possibility because the more people that you can meet and the more things that you can do, no matter what it is, the more opportunity you do have to get seen. It's really the only way. Thank you for that. Now, Walter, you, you've come from a very different approach, I assume. You, you didn't start off as an actor. Did, did, you didn't start off probably as a writer, either, did you? Correct. No, I'm still, I'm still neither of those. Let's <laughs> 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 see what we do about that. But, uh, yeah, so what has your path been? How did, how did you come into this strange, very unique kind of uh, position that you're in? Well, I, I am a great uh, supporter of thinking outside the box, because that's where the instructions are written. <laughs> but, um, I think that, uh, you know, in my case, it's been an unusual ride. And, you know, mine started as 13, and I had uh, hacked into NASA and stolen the shuttle blueprints and got busted by the NSA, and then lawyered up with them and turned them into my client. So all of you should try that for starting <laughs> That's a good start. But um, more seriously, I, you know, I'm a math guy, so I look at the world as a casino. I look at the odds of everything. I know if someone earns 400 grand a year, they're the top 1% in the US. If you're a billionaire, they're 150,000. If you're trying to get a show on the air and you know how many scripts are going into a studio versus how many they pick and how many they green light, how, you can know the odds of everything. And you know at each stage of approval, that you're now you've gone from one in a million shot to now you're down, you have a 20% shot and now you have a 50% shot because it's down to you and one other pilot. And being aware of that, I tend to calibrate my priorities the same way. But if someone gives you a, uh, a chance to reduce a one in a million shot down to a 20% chance, then you know we had someone casting for one of the shows who drove there the night before, made sure they knew the address. Uh, you know, for, did all the research, understood the background of the story and the company and the real story behind it, and then showed up fully prepared for the interview. Out of 20 people we interviewed for acting for this role, which is hopefully a 10-year run on a network show, only one person was fully prepared. The rest winged it and looked at the paper as they walked, came up in the elevator, and it showed. Um, so it's. Showing respect for the fact that you now have, you're going from one in a million shot to a 20% shot of getting, getting a, a good multi-million dollar year long career, probably worked doing the homework for one night. And I think that calibration in Hollywood of doing the math a little bit between how does this affect my Vegas odds and how do I behave appropriately towards that and how do I treat this person I'm meeting with 
as you know a thousand times more important than, than the person I go run into down at Starbucks is something I don't see enough of. That's very interesting. That's an interesting topic of just preparation. I'm sure more should could speak to that too because you have to see people all day long in various stages of preparedness or unpreparedness. Well, mostly I, I do see actors who are prepared. I think most actors, in my, for me, know that it's very, very important to be prepared. You can't always get the script, but I think there's something called show facts and, and sides express, and so you can often read the other sides for the other parts. You know, now, today, again, in the beginning of time, you know, we didn't even, I'm that old, we didn't even have fax machines, okay? If you wanted to read a script, you had to go sit in the casting director, you remember that? You had to go sit in the, can until I've Gary- i the elders talk about it. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the oldest one. Yeah, Gary Marsh's mother was an agent named right. Nora Sanders, and, and, uh, and Gary would come by the office, you know, and he would have to read the scripts for his mother, and that's how we really got the idea of the Breakdown Express, really. I mean, it's just transformed it, but it's been great for actors and because, you know, the scripts, you know, between being able to now email everything, getting things on Sides Express, you know, there really is no reason for an actor to not be prepared in some way. Um, there, there isn't, there, there really isn't, and, I, and I, I do think it's hugely important to be prepared when you go. I, one thing I want to say about casting directors, casting directors, so many actors are really afraid of casting directors. It's a very anxiety situation for them. And I would tell you that your casting director that you meet is going to be your best ally and friend. That going into auditions with a lot of anxiety about, you know, are they going to love me? They're going to hate me? I'm right? I'm not right? I mean, the truth is you don't ever know. And you could get the best audition of your life and not get it, and the worst, and you get the part. I got the part. How'd that happen? <laughs> and I don't think all, all of us are often a really good judge also of the perception that we, we give in a room. So I think it's always incumbent on actors to go into that room with their one shot that they have to make that connection with the casting director and do the absolute best job that they can for themselves and leave it on the table and go. Because when you do that, the casting director and you know Robert was saying earlier, you know, you never forget that person. And it might not be this job, but it's going to be another job. And when you are someone who walks in and does a good job, the casting director will bring you back and bring you back, and the top cast directors in this town work all the time. Eventually you will have an opportunity because of the work you did, you know, a year ago in somebody's office for a part that you didn't get. Again, it's a funny kind of partnership. Ideally we work together and, and find, you know make ourselves available and bring it all home. Um, that's interesting. Um, I had something I was going to ask you. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me. I think you've got something you want to say. Yeah, well, I'll, just, I'll, 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 I'll piggyback off of this. You know, having been on both sides of it, having been an actor and walked in the room, and now being on the other side of it where I'm the one hiring actors week to week on the shows, um, preparedness is a huge factor, as, as Walter was saying, and a lot of actors don't put in the work uh, based on um, their resume or perhaps maybe they feel like they shouldn't be in the room or they've been in the game long enough. What's happening now is because there's so much talent that's coming up behind and coming up, up, and coming up behind is it doesn't matter what you've done, it's what you're doing right now. And we just had a great conversation of these actors who are still in the game for 20 plus years because the field keeps getting smaller, but the talent, I said, and this was a quote that I came up with, uh, talent doesn't have an expiration date, right? And you're sitting in this room today, and I've literally, I've cast, I put a kid in a movie who sold me sneakers in Vancouver. I said, dude, you've got a great face. Do you want to be in a movie? And he was like, he's like, come on, come on. I said, if you show up tomorrow at this address and you're prepared and I'll make sure you get the script tonight and you crush this, you're going to be in a movie on Showtime. Sure enough, kid showed up, 19 years old, he was a natural. He ended up working and getting cast in the movie. So it just shows that it doesn't matter, and, and I don't want to see, actors should never be intimidated by other actors, right? Like, they sit, you know, you sit in the lobby, and you're like, oh, that guy's here again today, and she's here again today. It's you in that moment. When you walk in that room, that door shuts, it's you and us, and make that connection. And I say this to all actors, and then I'll stop speaking. Don't walk out of that room 
until you feel like you brought what you wanted to bring to us. And if that means, hey, you know what? Can I just make this? Can I try one more? You're going to get a yes. And you deserve that opportunity. Every performer deserves that, deserves that opportunity because you're putting in the work to get in that room. And don't leave before you feel like you've given your best. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just an addendum to that, too, is that you know, if you're at the point when you're in a, in, a, in a casting session with Robert, you're there because the casting director thinks you're good. They've either auditioned you, they've cast you before, they've watched your tape, they've seen you in something, and you're there because that person uh, thinks you're good and thinks you can get the part and wants you to be there, wants you to win. We want everybody to win. Believe me, it is not in my best interest to leave my casting session and get nobody cast. Mm. It is terrible and it is awful, and then you have to start all over again. Right. So honestly, you know, we want our actors to be as good as we as they possibly can be, so we can make our producers really happy. I would say attitude matters a lot too. Like I said, I'm, I have a unique perspective because I wasn't in this business up to about a year ago, but um, I was in the business for 30 years of running and fixing and flipping and buying and selling startup companies. And they live and die based on attitude and the people in them. They've got very little else to go on. So I looked at this new venture I was doing for Scorpion show as a startup. And when you're starting a startup and hoping it'll run for 10 years, I'm gonna have to work with these people. So if someone comes in and is a diva and isn't humble and isn't down to earth and doesn't want to read for us and blah, 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 I'm like, do I really want to marry this person in the next 10 years or not? <laughs> and what we found is, is typical is the ones who are truly talented, who have an amazing resume, who had a huge background, were the most prepared, the most humble, the, mo the most uh, well-read on what they did. And the ones who were full of attitude had very little substance. And you know, that tends to be a reflection of the world in general, but, <laughs> but that, that's, what we, that's what we found. And, um, you know, we were attracted to the non-divas, both guys and girls, saying, okay, I think I could work with this person. Because think about it, pilot week, you're casting, you're in a, 44 channels are casting simultaneously, you just got greenlit last Friday, you gotta start shooting in a month, you gotta pick someone quickly, and you've never met them before, and you're stuck with them for 10 years. You're gonna wanna pick someone you, want, you think you can work with. It's kind of like a first day in prison. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the next topic. Yeah. You know, we're, we may be getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But that's, these are all perfect statements. I, I think they're really, really well said. Getting in the room is, is a barrier. You know, just you know, it's wonderful to the point where you have the problem of, gee, I hope I can get there and find a parking space in time. Which, you know, the person that arrived the night before, I, I've done that too, where you go, you know, I'm not really sure where in Culver City this is. I happen to be in the neighborhood. I'm going to rehearse the, finding the parking. For the next day, anyway, it's scraping together the money for the parking. Is also a thing to do. But be, but getting into the room, I mean, when you have that problem, that's a wonderful problem. But just being seen, having a you know a really good opportunity available to you, that requires now, it seems to me, a little bit more cleverness, a little bit more resourcefulness than maybe ever before, and an increasingly challenging. And I want to, and I think we really should address, if we can, what unusual things people are doing or what you what you would recommend, Marsha, for example. Can I just say one quick thing, just real quick, just on what you said and go to that? Because he was saying people like, you know, non-divas. People like non-divas in life at all. Seriously, huh. it's, you know, being nice is free. I made some of my biggest industry connections years ago when I was waiting tables and when I was catering, and I was just a nice human being. And I would get to know more about them, you get to know people as people, and then years later, they remember you. So if you meet them in a business situation, they go, oh, I already like that person, so please remember that. Yeah. Good. Unless, of course, you're auditioning as, as a diva. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw out all this advice. <laughs> so what, what sort of interesting things have we heard about? What, uh, thinking outside the box and doing some, uh, something, I don't know, what, uh, what stories have you heard about people or, or done, perhaps you've done? I know I, I, I could share what I did, okay. since I, like I have an answer. I, <laughs> Uh, so I noticed after a long time that what got me a lot of attention was doing impressions. I didn't really think of myself as an impressionist, but it's one of the skills I have. And uh, I've done like uh, the famous jib-jab cartoons with the 
George Bush singing George Bush and <laughs> John Kerry and I did those and all those voices with Donald and Bill Clinton, all those. So, but I never really, you know, I think of myself as an actor, as I probably do, creative person. I don't think of myself in that. I hate to pigeonhole myself and, and think of myself as a guy with a velour sweater, you know, velour jacket in Vegas doing impressions. But I noticed that that's the kind of really good opportunities I got, and suddenly, you know, I came up alive to people if I concentrated on being an impressionist. So I, I thought instead of fighting that, I would do something about it. So I wrote a show, a one-man show, and then I thought to promote the show, well, I'll do a little video to promote the show because it was a space about this big, maybe 70 people, I was having trouble filling it. You know, it's LA, it's not a theater town, so I thought I'll do a video. So I did a video and it actually went viral. It was called Shakespeare and Celebrity Voices and filled the theater and started me on a career, a totally nice art, that only recently has completely petered out. But <laughs> <laughs> the point is, it was me, and I learned a lesson that by, by leveraging, if you will, my own uniqueness and what I thought was interesting and what I thought would be engaging and fun, uh, it had a tremendously huge effect. Rather than if I'd sent out maybe 10,000 headshots to Marsh's office and everybody's office in town and spent the money and done the traditional in the box kind of route. So that was my experience. Mm -hmm. Anybody else ever heard of anybody? How did you start? Anybody? How did you get your first break as an actor? Is everyone here over 18? <laughs> um, I, I actually found my agent. Uh, my agent found me um, in the valley. Uh, I'm walking out of Jerry's Deli at 4.30 in the morning. Um, and uh, I, was, I was walking to my car. And uh, I'm, he said, hey, can I ask you a question? Are you an actor? And I had literally been here about 10 days. And I said, yeah, I'm an actor. Are you an agent? He said, of course I'm an agent. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, of course I'm an agent. He said, of course I'm an agent. I said, OK, cool. Do you have a car? And he said, of course I have a car. And he goes to region as well. And he goes, you're not going to believe this. I said, well, you're not going to believe this. But it's 4.30 in the morning. I'm out. I got in my car and I started to pull away and he runs down Ventura Boulevard and he bangs on my door. He's like, I found my car. <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. So you're an agent. Um, and uh, 10 days later, I was on an airplane to Hawaii, um, guest starring on my first network television show. And um, it was a very weird way to have, you know, just to, to do it. but. Um, what happened when I got the part was my resume had coming out from Chicago was completely fake. Mm. Uh, I said I was in SAG. Uh, I said I'd done every movie shot in Chicago. And so when I got offered this guest star role on the CBS show, they called my agent and they said, hey, there seems to be some sort of a problem because we called SAG to put his work through. He's not in SAG. And my agent is in, I'm in the office with my agent talking to the casting. And she goes, can you hold on a second? She goes, what's wrong? I said, she goes, aren't you in all those movies? I said, not really. <laughs> and I shot there, and I was an extra in a few of them. And she's like, what are, you know, then the director got on the phone, and he was livid, because I had to be in Hawaii like the next day. And she's getting her ass chewed out, and I took the phone from my agent. And I said, hey, how are you doing today? He said, I'm not doing real well, man. I just offered you a role, and your, your resume is not real. And I said, well, let me just ask you one question. Was there a better actor who came through for this role? If you tell me yes, hire them. If not, put me on a plane to Hawaii. And he paused. And I said, that pause just told me what I need to know. I'll see you in Hawaii. And I handed back the phone. And I said, my deal. And that was it. And that's way outside the fucking box because the truth of the matter is that could have gone one of two ways yes. right yeah. but it worked out and that's the chicago way that's <laughs> wow that's very unusual so what now of course you hear these stories you hear these apocryphal stories these interesting fables and people doing something outrageous and and cutting through and being noticed and it's it's kind of what I do is I try to glean, well, what is the common denominator of that activity? Obviously, if we all go to Jerry's Deli tonight at 4.30, <laughs> it's not going to happen. And it'll never happen for you that way again. Correct. And it would not happen, you know, that is a very particular thing. But what do you, can you distill down to what the factor is, or any of us, what, what do you think that, I, I, that is? I think what I look for in, in actors, what, what I gravitate towards in actors, is you could tell immediately 
right, when you see someone. You inherently can tell. Just as human beings, we can tell. You know, whether you read a person um, when they walk into a room to meet you for the first time. Um, that, that tells me a lot immediately about that person. And they don't have to be the best looking person. They don't have to be. I cast a guy in a movie to play, the character was written as Polish. And I cast a five foot seven, 384 pound Trinidadian guy to play a guy named Mike Wachowski because I could not take my eyes off this individual. He was so physically striking to me, 5'8", 400 pounds from Trinidad. And everyone's like, it's a Polish guy, right? You realize that, I'm like, forget it. This is it. Mm -hmm. And you just know, and, and, and there's a confidence that I think every actor, and by the way, I just have to back up, because if you haven't seen Jim's work, it will take the back of your head and put it on a shelf. <laughs> His show of impressions and his, but you, this man is underplaying his ability as an impressionist. He's one of the best in the world. It's yeah. astonishing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it's like, you, know, you just sit there. Um, but it reminds me, I'm making a return to the back of his head. <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, I think what I look for, it, it doesn't have to be a physical thing. I just look for what's the internal thing going on. And I think we all get to a point in our lives, and you've seen, would you say, tens of thousands over the years? and I'm coming up well into the thousands and thousands of actors now, um, it's how you walk in that room. It's how you approach us at a restaurant. It's how you say, excuse me, can you hold the elevator door? It's just these little things. It's, it's humanity at its finest, mm -hmm. because humanity at its worst, like you said, there's, there's no time. And this town is fast and small, right? And if you're not presenting yourself in that way, to get to the front of the line, to the back line, it's real quick, right? So we're, we're always looking for people, I'm looking for those people who just bring something inherently to them, a confidence, a strength, an awkwardness, a goofiness, mm -hmm. and it just, it's that one thing that just clicks in your mind and you go, yeah, come with me. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I wanna <coughs> take two parts of the question, because I think, you know, for, for me, with actors, I'm always looking for someone who has a compelling uh, quality. You know, people ask me, I've been asked a lot of times, well, how do you, what's a star? How do you know that person is going to be a star? Well, you're not really. But what you do know is that that person has a compelling quality that makes you want to watch them. Mm -hmm. And then when they're acting, there's kind of this feeling of uh, reality, you know, reality to what they're saying, which is acting or it's not acting, because ultimately it doesn't really matter because it's what I feel, you know? So. You know, the important thing about training for acting is to give yourself a level of confidence so that you have the tools to deal with things in a room. But, the, you know, when you're being asked to read or to be able to take direction, which is so critical as an actor, when someone gives you direction, you must be able to adjust your performance. If you, if you can't incorporate the notes, you know, right away and kind of think about it for a few minutes or a few seconds and kind of make that change, you know, you're going to be out because it's that's over. Because if people feel that you can't be directed, no matter what you're doing, that's a big problem too. But I, but I do think it's you know, for me, what makes stars is that we want to watch them. I mean, I mean, you know yourselves from seeing movie stars, and you think, well, that person maybe they're not such a good actor. Why are they a movie star? Well, because we want to watch them. And I think that that's kind of a unique quality that only a few people have, and. It's not necessarily based on how they look even. There's just something so about them. Like and you know, you, it's something, after time you feel about people when they come in to see you. You, you. you feel something, you feel something. You know, and Robert's saying something else usually important that people don't understand, which is that what's going on between you and the casting assistant, the casting associate, is going on from the minute the person comes out of the lobby to take you into the room, or the minute you walk in the door. The brain works is working. The brain is incorporating and picking up things about you long before you open your mouth and start talking that we don't even know about while it's happening. If things are registering in our brains and we're formulating a picture of what we feel and think about you even before you're acting, which then ultimately contributes to how we feel about what you did in your reading, even though it's not always something that you know is happening. Which is why it's so critical that you know everything is part of your experience, not just walking in the door. 
hi, hello, you know, so good to, okay, you know, read. It's, I think it's so much more because it's, and it's so, it's so incredibly subtle and you gotta remember that. And that's just the, the workings of the human mind, I think, as you probably know. Absolutely. Because that's, you know, Walter's the area. You got but, a mind, right? Yeah. No, well, Walter's, this is what he deals with, you know, where, what the mind does about a lot of things long before we actually know what we're thinking, it's something's happening in our brain, you know, and it takes a while to catch, to catch up with it, but it is happening. So, you know, there's, there's, that, there's that aspect of it to, to not forget. And I think, again, going back to something, you know, Jim is saying, that we're not, everybody can't be a star, but it can't be a leading lady, a leading man, an entrepreneur. We can't, you know, no, you can't. You, but you have to find out, I mean, it's a business, you know? It's, it's called show business, but actually emphasis on business. It's a business. And, and, and you are the product. You are the commodity. You know, that's what you are. And so you have to think about yourself. And I've heard, I, I've heard people talk about this before, and I think it's a confusing topic for actors. But you have to understand a little bit about what you're selling about yourself. And not go in for things you're totally wrong for, because you can't be good at that, and you won't be remembered. So what you want to do is go in for things you know, that really connect with something true to who you are. And you have to understand about that about yourself. And it's the same thing with representation when somebody sees you. You know, you know, a group of talent agents can sit in a row or managers or casting people and watch every single person here read. And, you know, yeah. You know, maybe one like really good looking gal who's funny that everyone's gonna want to represent, but in the end, they all feel different things. And they all look at you or you or you and go, wait, I think I can sell this person. Because they, you know, they don't make any money till you get a job, remember that. So, you know, they gotta think that they can sell you. They gotta think that they can sell you. So they have to have there's something about you you have to put forth that like what defines me? You know, what did, how is this person going to make money? How am I going to make money? What's, what makes me a saleable commodity, even though I'm in, uh, going to be I'm an artist, uh, you know, and I want to be an artist, and in much the way that, you know, Jim found what he wanted to do. I mean, you know, comfort, there's commercials, you know, there's voice work, um, you know, th there's a lot of different things that you can do as an actor to place yourself in places where people see your work, whether it's a commercials, <coughs> everything. And, and I uh, go back to, again, what I said, which is that putting yourself out into the world to just now the answer is part two of the question is, okay, now, I was just talking about what happens when you're in front of people. You know, here you're in front of a producer, because so he has to bring you in. But you're saying, but yeah, but wait a minute, I can't have an agent. I don't have a manager. I don't have anybody. I can't, how am I going to get in front of a cast director? OK, it's really, really, really hard. I'm not going to lie to you. And it's really gotten harder, because you know, people do not really understand that everyone uses Breakdown Express, and you know, you put something out, and you get 1,400 submissions for cop number one with mm -hmm. two lines. So I mean, how is anybody going to really get seen? I mean, really, it's tough. That is why all of you have to take responsibility, whether you're with representation or not, for what you're doing to get seen. And again, that becomes, it's your job. You know, nobody's paying you, unfortunately, but it is your job to find ways to keep yourself out in the universe of acting, no matter what it, no matter what it is. Like Indie.com, these wonderful channels. Yeah, because that, that, is that is the only way that anyone will ever see you. You know, and they will, whether it's in an acting class, acting with other actors, whether it's, you know, in a stand-up comedy club, whether it's, again, a web series or a I mean, there's a million things, you know. And there are more opportunities, but the only way that anyone can ever see you and formulate an opinion about you before you even get the agent to get in the room with people is by seeing you in something, anything, where they might come across you and have the same kind of response I do to an actor. There's a wonderful story about, do you remember Al Molinaro? Uh-huh, sure. On the Happy Days show, Arnold was played by a big Italian guy named Al Molinaro. And there's a story, which I think is true, that he was a struggling actor, and he one day got it into his head to take all his headshots and composites and funny photos of himself and make a big poster that said Al Molinaro actor and put it on cardboard and made this big poster. So this is really like an art piece. And then he went to Gary Marshall's office yes. and, and dressed up like a delivery person <laughs> and said that he had this special 
package for very long ago. And uh, Gary had to sign for it himself. He could not hand it over to the receptionist. And so we got into Gary's office, and Gary said, What do you have? It's not right. Got to sign it. That's a good invitation, Gary. I'm working on it. He's a mythical figure in my damn. Anyway, he laid it down, and then he said, thank you, Mr. Marshall, and he took off, and then Gary Marshall opened up the thing and said, oh my god, that was the guy who was just here. So both the, I mean, more important than the poster, and the, you know, doubtless incredible art presentation there was, was the fact that this guy had the moxie and the imagination to invade his privacy that way in such a wonderful, wonderful way, and then he went on to be in The Odd Couple and in Happy Days, and had a really nice career. He's a terrific uh, character. You know, I've worked with Gary on several movies, and I mean, one of the things that Gary always does with actors is he wants to know, do you have like a special talent? Like, mm -hmm. it isn't enough right. that the actor reads. He yeah. wants to know, do you juggle? Do you tell jokes? <laughs> do you have funny voices? You know, he's really big, big on that sort of thing. Or for instance, I just thought, you know, if you do stunts, I mean, you know, so I worked on a film last year where, you know, I cast a number, I had some very good roles that ran the whole movie, but actually mostly I had, they had, they didn't have that many lines, but they were really good roles in the film. And I knew how to read stunt actors, and knowing how to do stunts can be a really good opportunity for actors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Being well, a well-rounded person, an interesting person, and involved with life kind of person, I think is good on many levels. <laughs> no one would disagree with that. Walter, you've been so quiet, and you have the biggest brain in you. So I wanted to, <laughs> actually, it's not the same. But I wanted to involve you in this and think about, I mean, not because obviously auditioning and and, and all this sort of world is a little bit not really your province. But I imagine you have to hire writers. Is that too true? Do you have to interact with them and look for talent that way? And is that a similar sort of process? Yeah, well, we, we hire over 3,000 people in the company, so we've hired a few. And not all personally, but um, when, you know, when we go to hire, uh, we are looking for people with um, some something special about them, definitely they have to stand out from the crowd. And we're looking for whether they really love their craft. You know, whether it's, um, you know, on the writer's side, we ask them what they've written for fun, you know, what they wanted, what they haven't done that they're just trying to get fun to your soul. What's the secret novel they're working on? <laughs> to see, are they doing this to pay the rent, or are they doing this because they love it? And uh, that can make a big difference. Um, we also then, you know, uh, we have unique ways of interviewing them, but we come up with impossible questions where we want to see how they handle adversity, how, how they react under pressure, how they act, react to confrontation, how well they handle um, verbalizing their thought process, because we have 13 different writers on the show. They all, if you just sit there silently stumped, no one can help you. But if you verbalize kind of what you're kind of sort of trying to say, and someone else may jump in with exactly the right analogy or the right word, so you can say it. Uh, so we want to know if they can be a team player that way. Um, so all those factors make a big difference. Um, and it is a business like any other. You know, you're trying to hedge your bets and risks. You're trying to see if it's as important to them as it is to you. You're trying to run away from any sign of flakiness whatsoever. I'm watching for those kind of red flags. Now that's I got I got to stop you there and say now when you say flakiness, I know what I think is flaky. Probably everybody has an idea what they think is flaky. What do you mean when you say flaky? Well, for these kind of things, if you're not 15 minutes early, you're late. Um, if you're not prepared, that's a one sign of flakiness. In your communication, when you reach out, and someone does try to reach out, you'll call back, and your cell phone's buried at the bottom of your purse can't find your charger, didn't check your voicemail, too used to texting, et cetera, et cetera, where basically you're just, you don't communicate mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. You're not on top of your stuff, you're not on it. Where, you know, in life, we'll have all kinds of different opportunities. I might reach out to 20 different people. And it's the one who gets back to me first is gonna get the opportunity. I'm not gonna wait for the other person to check their voicemail every four days when they find a charger that they forgot to have in their car. Mm -hmm. And you know, people laugh this off, but it's, it's very serious. I, I get those kind of people regularly who then get back to me and I'm like, yeah, that was three days ago. It's, it's over now. Whereas the other person calling back three minutes later because they're on top of it. And they'll be the first I call next time because why do I want to waste my time? Yeah, exactly, because the goal is instant service. You want, you want to create service quickly. You want to get your show done quickly. You want everybody to be on the team. You want people to respond immediately. That makes perfect sense. Well, it also means as we're working with them, if things change, if we move the location, if 
if we need uh, them somewhere quickly to help us out with something. They're reachable. They're good communicators. I think it's as simple as that. I want to work with good communicators that are plugged in and care. It is a communication business, after all. Storytelling, art, this sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I thought with my, my microphone was probably eight times. <laughs> now, speaking about speed, uh, oh, I was going to say, say something? Yeah, um, so I had a really good holy shit moment a few years ago, actually, that kind of changed my whole universe. Um, I uh, was, I've done tons of different things. I was an actress, I was a producer, I was a casting director, I did it all. Um, but I also did it as a good girl. I was really good at following the rules. And I would get advice from people, and then I've noticed that everyone's giving the same advice. And a lot of people I'm getting advice from, uh, it's not even working for them. And they keep talking about these rules. Well, y'all, what are these rules? I mean, people would tell you it is a rule. You cannot show up at an agent's office and just knock on the door and try to get on in. But that was an example. I know several people who did the same thing. So things that you are told not to do, why not? Like some, this is a kind of a weird example. So it actually happened to me. So one day I'm like, you know what? Screw the world. I'm going to have an idea. I'm going to do it. And I remember that two years before, when I was catering, I happened to be at a party, and there happened to be a drunk guy who happened to work at an agency. Um, and uh, he said, you should come to my office sometime. That was two years before. And I didn't do it because he was drunk, so I didn't know if he meant it or not. But you know what? I said, screw it. You know, whether he meant it or not, he said it, so I'm going to show up. So <laughs> I go. I get dressed up. I show up. Guys, this is one of the biggest agencies in town. It is Fort Knox. You walk, I literally walked in. I'm like, hey, my name is Nicole Green, but I'm here to see blah, blah, blah. And they're like, great. What time is your appointment? I'm like, oh, I don't have an appointment. He just told me to stop on by. And she's like, oh, well, hang on a second. Her demeanor changed completely. I all of a sudden started being treated basically like a stalker. She sits me down, comes back to me, and says, I'm so sorry, we cannot see you. Now, I could have been really depressed or feel awful or embarrassed, but actually I was really excited that I did something that I never would have done before, and I left in the best mood ever. And then the next day, I was having dinner with a friend, and I tell him this story, and I'm acting out the woman, I'm acting out me, and I'm so excited and proud that I actually did this. And the guy goes, oh, you know what? I went to college with one of the guys who works at the agency. And then I got a meeting right after that. And also, that person who liked my attitude about that whole story, I'm now working with is actually one of the heads of a major studio now. So literally, y'all, you never know how it's going to lead. Don't listen to rules. Um, and you know what? So number one, be very careful who you get your advice from. If it's not working for them, for, for them it's not going to work for you. And number two, for big people, like you want to get advice from people who really know what they're talking about, who have succeeded. And the best piece of advice I was ever given was ask for advice. Don't say, hey, can I have this audition? Hey, could you do this for me? Could you do this for me? Because if they can't, they feel bad. People actually like helping other people, but if they can't, they feel bad and could kind of avoid you. But if instead you just say, hey, would you mind giving me some advice on this? They will talk your ear off for like an hour and a half. And at the end, they usually go, and if that doesn't work, call me. <laughs> now, the thing is, though, when, that, when you do that, because you should, uh, then the next day you need to do every single same thing that they told you to do. So you can't just go, I had a great conversation. They said if it didn't work, call me. If you don't do the actual steps, you haven't done yourself any good. But if you actually do all those steps and you call them back two, two days later and said, I did this, this happened, this, this happened, literally, they will help you. To, I mean, they'll see how proactive you are, you know? So follow through. Not flaky, like he said. Robert. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Robert, uh, where do you see things heading in the future for, for this business? And for actors. I think it's incredible. I think right now there are, uh, I forget what the statistic was that just came out on the number of scripted shows right now. Uh, John Mangrove said it was staggering and you know, 1,400 script on, on every different platform from DirecTV to ABC. Um, I think it's gonna keep growing. I think there's gonna be new networks popping up. I think streaming services like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu who are doing original content right now are some of the most exciting places for filmmakers and talent to go to be able to tell their stories. And I think it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing, which is going to afford more and more opportunities for actors, for writers, for directors and producers to be able to go, I don't have to go the traditional route anymore. It's not just ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, which are all great homes. 
but if those places don't want the product that you are trying to get made, then now you have so many places you could go. When you look at places like Animal Planet is doing scripted series now. Really? Yeah. Uh, for Homo sapiens? For, yeah, for Homo sapiens. <laughs> uh, it does have to have, uh, it does have to have maybe perhaps an animal theme, you know, which would make sense because it's Animal Planet. Um, but, um, you know, this year my wife and I started watching this TV show called Younger. Oh, yeah. It's fun. It's, it's amazing. My daughter, my on daughter, TV daughter. land. Yeah. Right? And you're watching the show on TV land, which years ago was called the TV Guide Network. And they used to just run old uh, sitcoms over and over and over again with, at the top, you never lost the TV Guide. And now it's a huge destination. ABC Family is doing some of the best one-hour television on TV now. MTV. MTV is getting back heavily into scripted. So it's just going to keep growing, which is only going to widen the, the terrain for people to continue to have outlets. And I think that's phenomenal. Do you think that's going to speed up just the velocity of the business? I mean, it's going to get, obviously, that many channels are all competing for everybody's attention. You can only watch, you know, you can only binge watch <laughs> so many no, shows. It's overwhelming. It, it's really overwhelming. So I imagine the speed of everything, like you're saying, just uh, like Walter has said, you know, just the, the being able to uh, communicate quickly, getting ideas across quickly, getting appointments made, and all the, the nuts and bolts of actually running the business. Now, Marsha, I know in your industry, it's, it's sped up a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I imagine that's just going to continue. And what's that going to look like, I wonder? Anybody have any ideas? Well, this may be a slightly different tangent to that. I, I, I may be story of my life a little ahead of my time on how soon this drops, but if you don't know what Oculus Rift is or Microsoft Hollow or uh, Magic Leap, then you're going to be obsolete in five years. Um, so you, think you need to understand what those are, where they're at, and what they'll do to your business. Um, just, a, just a show of hands. Anybody know what the hell those things are? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm third. All right, well, third of you will still be working. We're all the survivors. <laughs> the rest of us will meet on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I mean, this is what people got excited about in the 1990s, which was virtual reality. Except it didn't work, it had a big bulky helmet, it made you feel nauseous after five minutes. The resolution wasn't there, and we didn't have the bandwidth. So it didn't look realistic. But now it does and it changes the game. And uh, just go to YouTube, type those names in, and see what that looks like. But it changes training, it changes video games, it changes movies to become like choose your own adventure. You can affect the outcome. Cinematography becomes uh, either irrelevant or removed because you have no idea where your audience is standing. There's new moral guides for the directors because they can traumatize someone now because that person believes they're in the movie, especially if it's a horror movie. Um, so it's a moving into virtual reality and augmented reality is as different as when we went from pantomime to moving into camera angles. It's that big a shift. I remember that day. And this is... <laughs> this, this is sci-fi or, or something that happens 50 years in the future. This happened three years ago, you just haven't seen it yet. So there are promos in this right now for the, the, the Mission Impossible and the, the Ter Terminator movie and the other movies are all already casting people for promos in VR. And those promos will just get longer and longer and longer. And uh, when you were talking about technology and age and over time, I'll make you feel slightly better. The fax machine was invented in I think about 1901. Uh, you, you were saying it worked before fax machines, but the first time they caught on was about 1981 because because until two people had one, no one, <laughs> no one bothered buying it. Uh, Vimeo, Vimeo, Xerox and Sides, whatever was the typewriter. You know, just an aside to what you're saying, because you touched upon something, you know, video games. is a big, big, you know, gaming is huge now, and in many ways, uh, you know, transforming what people watch on television, which keys into what you're saying, and they need actors for those things. 
And I, you know, which brings me to this idea that I think a lot of people come into show business or like Hollywood, which is, is an idea as a, more than a real thing. And you know, they equate sort of being an actor kind of with stardom in some way or recognition. And you know, you have to make that decision. Do I want to be a working actor who makes a living? Or do I want to be a famous actor? And, and, and sometimes they're not the same. Uh, but being a working actor is something that's very possible for everybody here because of everything that's available from you know, commercials and industrials and voiceovers and video games and all kinds of you know, web series. You're not gonna, you may not get rich doing it, but um, you can make a living as an actor in this business if you're not totally hooked up on, you know, I've gotta get a series regular on a television show. You know that's that's just what that's just how it is, and and I think it's also because the nature of the film business has changed so much, in, in that you know you're going to see all, and I'm sure you will do. Uh, all these television shows have very, a lot of famous movie actors on them now. Yeah. Well, to that point, if you want to, if you want to know, I have, have a loose wire. It's not all the way around. I technical problems. <laughs> um, you know, in any industry, if you want to know where the industry's headed, follow the money. So just some basic stats for you. Um, I'm a shareholder, and many of you may know this, but the video game Grand Theft Auto. So that last, the production budget for that last movie game was 250 million. It made a billion in 72 hours. It made nine billion in total. Um, that makes it the largest entertainment franchise in the world, bigger than Avatar, Star Wars, or Titanic. Um, that's that's not an industry to ignore. And more and more, those games are, you know, when, when I was talking about the virtual reality stuff earlier, and affecting the outcome and standing where you want, and the movie can be affected by where you're at, well, it's a slippery slide. At what point is that movie a game? At what point is the game a movie? Um, it's the same thing. You know, also, too, I think we were talking about this earlier, and one of the things I've that I think makes Robert so wonderful is his knowledge of actors. A number of people here raise their hands about being directors. And I would also encourage those of you who are directors to really educate yourself on actors. Uh, it's very, very important that you know who actors are, what they do, what they're capable of. You know, recognize names of people when someone says who they are. You'll be much better at what you do and you'll also have a much better time in your casting process because you will be able to explain what it is you need. I, I think I think also um, conversely for actors it's like the Holly Shorts. I mean, uh, you know, because so many people have the equipment now at home so cheaply and expensively to make their own films. Lots of people are making films. You can make your own films. Uh, you know, Birdie.com. I've seen plenty of them on their website. But for lots of other places or for submissions and film festivals all around the world, you know, people are making shorts. It's a big business because and it's relatively inexpensive. And a lot of young directors get started with shorts. And if you're an actor working for somebody in their short for not a lot of money or very minimum, you know, the sag lowest, lowest minimum in the world, but you know, that director can go on to be very, very successful and you're in a relationship with that person because you've done their short and that's, a, that's another way to get seen. And casting directors, I mean, I've been to every film festival. I mean, I've been to Sundance 14 times. I mean, Toronto, I know a lot of, I, you know, as a casting director, I went to a lot of film festivals. And I found a lot of talent that I'd never seen before at these film festivals. And so, you know, we, we are always out there looking for people. And it just is what everybody's saying, you know. But again, you, you have to get yourself into things. And if you don't have an agent, a lot of this stuff doesn't need agents. You know, you can go out and get this stuff yourself. And there are ways for people to see you, a lot of ways. I think, I think it's interesting from an effective networking point of view, what you're saying is true. There's a book called Effective Networking. If you're not effective at it, and you're not organized enough at it, you're not structuring it, that you need to contact someone 22 times on average to get a yes. Um, and you may get their card and call them once and give up. Um, but the other part of this is, if I flip this a little bit again, comparing it to what I call the real world, which is my other business, if I was hiring a programmer and he came into my office and I said, well, do you, do you like Microsoft or Macintosh? He's like, oh, no, I don't use software. And, no, I, uh, who, who's Microsoft? I've never heard of that one. Um, that's what it sounds like to me when I meet someone who says they're in the acting business. 
and they've never heard of it. Like, I don't watch TV, and no, I don't go to the movies much, and I haven't uh -huh. seen the top 12 shows that where the ratings beat CSI and NCIS, and I've never heard of them. I'm like, so how into this are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I have nothing to do with this business, and I know all of those shows. So it's, I know you can be busy and you can be on Facebook and you have other things to do, but think about it. This, <laughs> think about it from this point of view. If you're at a party and you run into a director, or producer, or, or someone else, and you can't talk intelligently about the industry or who they are or, or, or what what they're doing next or what's coming out or what their ratings are like, you just killed your chance to network and connect with them. Yeah, that's what you were talking to about it being a business, and that's a business-like approach, is that you know not only about your aspect of it, but you know all the ancillary things that you have to connect with, you know all the players, and the more, and you can't really know too much about it, uh, and, and then that allows you to take advantage of a lot more of your resources. I'm talking to myself, because I always do this wrong. And I, I'm one of those guys who goes, I don't really watch TV. It's a big mistake. <laughs> big freaking mistake. Now I get away with it a lot because I'm always being uh, asked, can you do this voice? Can you do this voice? This guy from this show. This guy. And I go on YouTube. Thank God for YouTube. Huh? Mm -hmm. find things in a jiffy. You know, it's just hard for actors, though, and creative people. It's a tough thing because, you know, in general, creative people, that's why they're being creative because business is not where they wanted to spend their life, you know, in, in, in that way. And so getting your head around the fact that you do have to think of yourself as your own little business and apply a lot of the things that Walter is talking about and Robert has said are, are, are critical to your survival as an actor. You, you really kind of have to get out of that discomfort place and, and that sort of, you know, I don't want to have to do this feeling. It's hard. It's really hard. You know, no one is saying it's easy. It's really hard. And it's really hard if it's not your nature to be that kind of person. But it is what's required of you to break through. And this is a, a perfect time if I could jump in. There's also don'ts, right? Um, there's, there's certain don'ts that apply to this business that also apply to the world. For instance, um, I had an actor come in and read for me, who in the middle of his audition turned his back to me and my cast and directors and then turned around and had taken a gun out from a gym bag that was in the corner. A real gun. So it shouldn't have been from a bag. He should have should right. And I don't <laughs> I don't have a problem with props. I really don't. I think props are cool. I know some people, props, yeah. some, some people hate, hate, hate props. Um, I don't, if, it, if it helps you in the moment, bring a prop. I'm not going to care one way or the other as long as it's not uh, interfering. But this dude literally took a 9mm gun out of his gym bag. Although he said, you know, he chambered around and pointed it right at the cast and the director's head to continue the scene for the interrogation. And I stood up and said, you're done. He said, no, I'm not, man. I'm only halfway through the scene. I said, no, the scene ended the minute you brought that out. Put me and my casting directors in jeopardy. You are now done. And he said, no, dude, it's not even loaded. <laughs> I said, but you don't understand what's happening here because we're having a real disconnect in the reality of the situation. You thought when you woke up this morning that it was okay to come to an audition <laughs> with a firearm, loaded or not, then spring it on us, then hold it to my casting director's head, then get offended because I stopped your audition. <laughs> I can't be in your space, man. Like, you are an unsafe human being. <laughs> right? He was so upset, he didn't understand why I couldn't see it. Okay, so that's a don't. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, just in terms of the networking of it all, I'm, I'm very open in terms of, you know, I'll give people my card and it has my, my personal email, my business email, whatever. Um, and I'm very honest, I'll say, look, give me your information, please send me an email with the heading uh, where we met. So here it would be uh, indie.com on the heading, just so I know where it was. I'll reach out, I'll say, hey, great meeting you as well. If there's anything that should come up down the road, I'll let you know. If there's nothing that you're right for, I will never bring you in because it's a huge monumental waste of your time, right? And I don't think it's a service 
You know, and actors go, oh my God, no, just bring me in so I can get the experience. I get that half of it, but the other half of it is, I want, if I'm gonna bring anyone in, I wanna make sure they're right for it, okay? Um, so the do is, hey, here's my number, here's my email. Email me once. We'll stay in touch and if there's something right, great. Um, the don't is, please don't wait outside my offices. <laughs> It's six in the morning with a fire arm. <laughs> with breakfast in a bag for me, telling me you got me breakfast, and can we go upstairs and have a meeting? That's a little bit of a don't because you have to respect. I mean, I ate the breakfast, don't be crazy. <laughs> There's just certain things you would do in the business world that you need to apply here. And because this is a very casual business, you know, this is a very casual, hi, nice to meet you, we don't wear suits to work. Um, more often than not, I'm mistaken uh, as a grip on my TV show. <laughs> True story, uh, Eric Roberts, who you could do much better than me, but I usually wear just cut off dickies and a t-shirt on, on shooting days, and Eric Roberts was in wardrobe. And I came in to introduce myself on the cleaner because he was coming out to the show. And he looks up and he goes, uh, just give me a bottle of water, buddy, like that. And he dismisses me. I said, oh, two bottles of water, Mr. Roberts? He said, fucking three. And he dismissed me. And I said, OK. And I ran off and I came back with three bottles of water. And he drank all three and it was going on. And he said, well, when am I going to meet the creator of the show? And everyone in the room just turned and smiled. <laughs> So it's a very casual business, but don't mistake casual for boundaries, because we all have them. We, everyone in this room has a boundary that is acceptable. So although it's very casual, please be respectful of what it is we do as we respect what it is you do, meaning if you prepare for an audition and it's four pages, trust me, when you come in, I'm gonna have you do all four pages. Some people might go, hey, right? Like something you want, let's lose the second scene. And that's sometimes happens more often than not, but at least we want to give you the opportunity. And if we say, hey, let's just do the first scene, the do is, okay, great, I love the first scene. The don't is, the fuck, I was up all night working on both scenes, I'm doing both scenes. <laughs> How about, how about this one? When they say yes, I, I do like to give people, I never like people to be feeling bad, but when people say, please let me do it, I can do it better, and then they don't. Right? <laughs> but I had, a great, I had a great experience yesterday with an actor, a very, very accomplished actor came in to read for Empire. And his first take was just, I mean, killed. Like, we could have literally taken that, flown him to Chicago, put him on set, shot it, it's a wrap. Like, it was that good. He goes, you know what, let's do another one. I'm like, we got the money in the bank, dude, you're good. He's like, no, let's do it. And he starts again, and he gets like halfway through it, and he looks right in the camera and goes, fuck it. The first one was brilliant. <laughs> I love that, too. Like, I'm like, dude, I love you for that. Like, just own it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, just be, I, I think the biggest thing is, is because we meet in these informal settings, and it's great, you know? When I was coming up, this wasn't, this was like, we didn't have this. We didn't have these places to go and meet young actors and young filmmakers and, and stuff like that. And, and, and I have hired so many people, not just on the, in front of the camera. I've hired personal assistants to work for me. I've hired PAs to come work on my shows. I've put people in the art department. I've put people in wardrobe. Out of these settings, it's legit. Like it's not bullshit. This, you know, you can make relationships here. Um, but just be respectful of what it is we do, as we are respectful of what you do as well. Very good. Well, good manners is a good thing. I mean, manners are there for a reason. They've survived for centuries. I think it's a great time to open it up to uh, questions. Don't you? Yeah. Please. Okay, let's. Anybody have a question? Please stand up and in a nice, clear voice. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stand up, if you will, and uh, issue your question. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. All right. I've been bypassed. Who's That's in charge? very exciting. <laughs> um, my name is Dana Hooper, and I was wondering um, how much uh, seeing on the actor's resume that says training, how much that actually affects um, them getting into the room with you, and also uh, after the actual audition, how much it affects the casting. You can ask that. Questions about training, how much that 
Well, I think training does matter just from a point of view, though. I think it's good for actors to, to actually, you know, take classes and know how to act so, yeah. to the degree that you have a set of tools that you can rely upon in auditions. Um, you know, setting, I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of acting teachers out there, but some of them I know, and I think some of them are very good, and I, so you, you know, it's another little piece of information that you see a resume and you kind of like just sort of calculate it, you know, about, oh, okay, they studied with that person, you know, they have to train. But there's something in you're taking in about the person, but then ultimately, depending on how the reading goes, if it's not great, that, that, that becomes irrelevant. It's just, it's always good to see what people are doing. I've always looked at, you know, what theater people have done, what directors they've worked with, what shows they've been on. You know, my, I have a lot of friends who are casting directors. Oh, which friends of mine have cast them on? I'm, I'm always absorbing all of that when I look at people's resumes. And for me, truthfully, um, I look at, when I get a resume on someone who's starting out, um, especially if they're starting out, I always tell actors who are beginning, I think improv is the basis for anything comedy, drama, if you could find like a really killer improv group to be a part of, study with, I don't care if it's like in a basement in Pacoima on Friday, exactly. but you have an improv basis because so much of what happens in this room, you know, when you come into the room to read for us, we're going to mix it up on you and you have to be able to go with it and you can't be thrown off your game. So improv, I tell everyone improv is like that and a cold reading class, you know, mm -hmm. um, just because when you come in on the day, if the audition goes well, nine out of 10 times, I'm gonna say, hey, can you hang out for a second? And I'm gonna give you some sides and I want you to come back in. Um, I had the, the greatest experience, if I could tell a real quick story, of my entire career was we hired an actress on a TV series last year um, who said she was fluent in Korean. And what happened is when she got to set, it was very clear that she did not speak a word of Korean <laughs> and had learned everything phonetically for her audition. But when she get on, when she had gotten on set, she couldn't remember a word of it and started to panic. And you know, we're we're shooting in this location that is costing us a fortune on the day. It's a huge setup for the character that reveals who he is for the whole season. And this woman is disintegrating because she doesn't know the lines. So we're at a, a point in the day where I have to make an executive decision, which is I have to fire this woman. But more than fire this woman, I have to recast it. Now, we lose the location in a matter of hours. And so I call back to the studio. I said, I have to, I have to let her go. She doesn't speak very well. Can we put it up on cue cards? No, we don't have time to put it up on cue cards. We got to move fast. As I'm firing her, a woman who I had seen earlier in the day at the other location around the corner, this Korean woman who was playing an orderly as an extra, was a craft services. And I said, Excuse me, do you speak Korean? And she looked at me and she said, Yes, and she barely spoke a word of English. <laughs> I said, Okay, um, do you, um, you're an actor? And she said, Yeah. And she was probably 30 years older than the actress we had on set. And um, I said, can you do me a favor? She said, what's that? I said, I'm going to give you, and the actor who was the lead in the show was fluent in Korean. It was great. Sun Kang was um, interpreting for me. I said, can you tell her, um, by the time I finish this cigarette, this is my last one, by the time I finish this cigarette, I'm going to audition her for the guest star in the episode. <laughs> And so he told her, she took it, I finished the cigarette, I came back, I said, are you ready? And I gave this woman 11 pages. Came back 10 minutes later. And I said, are you ready? Will you read the star of the show? She said, yes. And she put her sides down on the ground. What? That's what I said. No, I'm like, what? I said, well, you have to know the words. And she looks right at me and she goes, I know the words. <laughs> she does it off book completely off book, word for word for word, the emotion, everything. Then I look at her and I go, what size are you? Because <laughs> I have to get the other actress on a wardrobe. And we transform this woman who's been in this country for 37 years, who was a school teacher in Korea and has been working in this country and never had made more than $90 a day, is now guest starring on a network television show. And she burst into tears 
at the end of it, and she said, do I still get my $90 for being an extra oh. <laughs> <laughs> And so we're gonna add some zeros to that. <laughs> and I was weeping, and her husband drove over, and he, he, we called him to set, and he said, what did my wife do wrong? What did she do wrong? I said, no, 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 please come to set, sir. Uh, and we brought, we didn't tell him what was happening, and I brought him to Video Village, and the monitor was there, and it was her first close-up. I'll start crying right now. And the look on this man's face, this, this, this couple who came to, to come to this country together, he's watching his wife step forward with the hair and the makeup, starring in a TV show. That's why I do the shit I do, because like, you never know what's gonna happen on the day. You never know what situation is gonna present itself. Be in the moment, be prepared, because I guarantee you, it might happen for one person in this room, it might happen for all, everyone in this room. Right? Just be in the moment when it comes to you, you're ready to go. Because when that hammer drops, I want everyone to be able to do what they say they can do. Cool. Are there any actors here right now who know that they're damn good but are having just a hard time even getting the first auditions in the first place? Yeah? Okay. Pretty much everyone here, hey, yeah. So here's one thing I'm gonna tell you about now, I'll tell you about other stuff later, but th that was an issue that I had. I knew I was damn good for a while, and I just wasn't getting seen. Um, so one of the things that I developed um, with the company um, is every two weeks, we get a major casting director to judge and challenge for us. We get a big TV writer, Brad's here, he does most of it, he wrote for Law & Order, tons of other things. We literally post sides. We want you to treat it like a real audition, guys. We guarantee that every single casting director sees every single video. The insider information is, they see the first 30 seconds. If you're really, really horrible, they'll skip to the next one. But, yeah, but they watch every single one, and we get people from Balco Miller, April Webster Casting, like UDK, we're talking huge people. Um, right now they're calling in whoever they like based on talent. There's a voting thing too, but literally guys, for the judges pick, if you got two old, we don't even care, whoever's the best one gets called in for a meeting. Um, people who didn't even win are now getting called in for shows all the time. See, Ashley Caldwell was right there. She got signed by William Morris and Deborah from, from one of the challenges. So literally guys, it's free. Every two weeks, just do it. And no matter what, like, have you ever noticed that if you haven't been to an audition in a while, like you finally get one, you're so excited, but it doesn't go as well as you wanted it to go, but that's only because you haven't done one for a while. This is kind of like drilling you every single week. We now have some of our artists showing up for auditions, and the casting directors are literally, where's Travis, is he here? Yeah, he walked into an audition a few weeks ago, and she's like, Travis Dixon! Like this, this casting director from April Webster Casting literally watches his videos because he loves him so much, not only for her challenges, but every other one as well. So guys, check that out, it's free, and we, we get major, major people who really are bringing people in. And that's doable. They've made it very easy. Okay, any other questions? Oh, this gentleman here I was trying to get to before. Yeah, thanks a lot for everything you've all to share so far. And you've shared a lot really clearly about what you look for in, in actors and actresses. What is it that you might look for in a writer or director? For me, I, you know, all the writers that I hire on my shows and that I, I just want something in your voice, you know? I, I refuse. When we were, when I was staffing the cleaner, um, and agents were like, "Oh, he's got a great sample of CSI, or she's got a great sample of Six Feet Under, or The Wire," I said, "I want to read any of that. I want to just read something that is 100% in their voice. I don't care if it's a comedy. I don't care if it's a drama. It doesn't have to be associated to what the cleaner was about." And everyone's like, "Oh, he's got a great addiction script, or she's got a great heroin movie." I go, I don't, okay, you can send it, right? But like, I just wanna make sure it's in their voice. So I just want something, an original piece of work that is 100% in your voice. Not, a, not a, a speck of an existing show. You know, because we could all read a book on how to write and punch in the numbers, but I just wanna hear something and read something or watch something that is 100% in your voice. Because that, that's when I know I'm getting a writer. When we were looking for writers for the show, um, we had to interview quite a few. And again, it was about how seriously they take their work, how much stuff do they read, who, which things do they know about, how much homework have they done. But beyond that, it's about their angle and their take on it. And we deliberately let them know the facts about 
the background of the show, but we wanted to see how it would take it. Some took it in a sci-fi direction, some took it in a very House of Cards type direction. And then um, we had uh, one of the writers that I spent some time with, he said, so your IQ makes you one at 1.5 billion, that's pretty lonely. Nobody can empathize with you, nobody can walk in your shoes. There's five people like you on the planet, so I get it, genius is not always cracked up to be. Everyone wants to say, oh, it'd be great to be a genius, but is it? And he got it, he understood it. He understood that the show was about a dysfunctional family of superheroes who can't see the forest for the trees and need to be taught common sense because their EQs are much lower because their IQs are much higher. And that was the angle. It's like, okay, you got it, you figured it out. Um, that's what I look for in a writer. Can he get it? Can he absorb it? Can he understand it? Not just parrot what, what he thinks I want to hear. Good answers. What does EQ mean? Emotional. Emotional intelligence, yeah. common sense, <laughs> social skills. <laughs> uh, next, anyone else have a question? Prayer. Yeah, have a question right here. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Dickie Hartz. Sorry I'm late. I have a question um, as, from an actor's perspective. And so often, there's not often many deaf roles on, you know, in the Hollywood world. What could you? Me, yeah, me being a deaf actor, there's not many opportunities for me in TV shows and movies. So what would be your recommendation for me to get out there? Um, Marley Matlin is one of my dearest friends. And Jack Jason, uh, do you know Jack Jason? Who is her, yeah? Um, yeah, but that's one person. That's I understand. <laughs> and what? There's a whole television, there's a whole wonderful show switched to Burger Well, King. which is what Jack's working on as a consultant. Yeah. Um, but I think what's happening now, um, roles that maybe are not written for deaf actors. If you as an actor feel that you're right for that role, don't let anything stop you. I have white actors coming in for roles that are written as black, I have black actors coming in for roles that are written as white. And I think that if the opportunity is there, you see something that you are perfect for, who cares what it's written as? You know? And any other thoughts from the other panelists? You know, there's a wonderful theater company too here, uh, Deaf, theater, Deaf Theater West, who does incredible productions, and I think it would be wonderful to get involved in that group as well. Yeah, I've um, had worked with them before. Yeah. We're going Spring Away right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think right now, which I, I find, you know, diversity, and that's diversity, is, is a big issue for, for everybody. It's, a, it's out there, it's a topic of conversation, but we're all paying attention to I think casting directors try always to be at the forefront of those things, and, and now um, I'm finding that we're getting a lot of support for that, and people want to see it on the shows, and, and this is sort of what, you know, it's. We want to find people that are like the people that we come across in everyday life, so there are going to be more opportunities. And actually, a really easy way to be seen is the challenges that we're doing. Do each role, just literally do it in the sign. Just let the casting director know that you even exist. Every other week, brand new casting director. Good answer. Answers all. Good answers all. Yeah. Good Hi, answer. you're very close. My name's Rob Bruner. Hey. I'm not an aspiring actor, I'm an actor. Nice. I like that. Nice. Yeah. Um, I just had a question maybe for all of your, for you two perhaps, but um, I'm speaking about out of the box, when you have a breakdown for a certain character, how out of the box do you go in terms of, say, just as an example, say it's a funny guy, but he's supposed to be fat or big in the breakdown. Would you see somebody that's maybe a funny guy, but skinny? And would you, as a producer, when you put out breakdowns, how open are you to kind of, you know, being out of the box in terms of who, what the managers and the agents pitch to you? I mean, I, I don't worry too much about the physicality of it. You know, yesterday we were in session all day casting, 
for a very powerful uh, role. And we literally saw actors from four foot 11 to six foot six, okay? Just from a physical standpoint. It's what each actor brought. And let me tell you something, the dude who came in who was four foot 11, blew the six foot five dude out of the water in terms of possessing that confidence and that swagger and that, that, that energy. So I don't, I never worry about physicality unless it, it's a physical bit that has to play off the size of that person. That could be one thing. But generally, I don't, it doesn't, I get the submissions when they come into the cast room and we look at them, and I don't worry about size at all. Like, that means very little to me. Well, but you're, you're looking at the breakdowns, obviously, yourself, yeah? I write, I write them. No, I mean, you're going on breakdown, I don't understand that. No, no, but I, I mean, you're going on Breakdown Express, and you're looking at the actual submissions? Four times yourself? Yeah, yeah, what I'll do is either, you know, I'll go in and look at it, you know, because for instance, so if there's a role that you were submitted on, but it was written black male, 60s, whatever, you know, and you're like, I'm the guy, you won't, I might go, yeah, let's give Rob Bruner, Bruner, was it? Rob Bruner? Um, I, I think what's happening right now is Genders flipping in terms of male-female roles, roles that are written for men are now going to women and vice versa, which I think is cool. I think roles written for black act, like I said, it's just right now is a really exciting time. Um, what was the article I just read? Uh, an actress was cast as a role for The Good Wife, right? Uh, the Good Wife role was written for a man and um, Archie, Archie Punjabi's part? Right, that was written for a man. And Archie Punjabi's like, I don't think so. I don't think I'm gonna kill that. And that's how that role ended up becoming hers. And I just think like, you know, don't worry, if something comes out on the breakdown and you think you're right for it, just move forward. Well, I, I think there's again always well, aspects of looking at it. No, no, and I'm no, saying, you're absolutely right. you, know, you here have a very open-minded, you know, writer-producer who has a lot of power to, to say, I, I, you know, and he's, and he's fantastic. But you know, I think for me, it gets down to the compelling thing. Uh, you know, I look at the, you know, when I'm looking at the breakdowns and, you know, the submissions that are coming, and I'm doing the same thing as I used to do with the headshots or what I do when an actor comes in the room. You know, is there something compelling? And when I go through stuff, you know, yeah, it's like, oh, they want to back up. But then there's like somebody's face that mm -hmm. kind of pops out at me some days. Wow, this person, there's something about this look, this person, something on this resume. That's good. But I'm going to read this person anyway. They're not what they're looking for. I'm going to read them anyway. So I, I, I do do that because I feel things when I'm looking at stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, but would you get offended if the managers or agents submitted something? No, that because they do all the time. Oh, please. They do it all the time. You, they do it all the time. Yeah. And you'd be surprised what <laughs> shows up on my, you know, I need a nine year old boy. And there's like, no, yeah, a 60 year old, you know, whatever. Right. But they, they just submit everything. But, you know, again, it's. Um, you know, it's gotten so much better in that, uh, particularly with the diversity issue, because I, you know, it starts with you, the writers and the directors. It's really critical that you actually have an open mind, because you are the ones who are writing from your own experience. And so a lot of times, I just have seen this, you know, it's like, okay, doctor. Well, and like, if you're a person of a certain <coughs> racial persuasion, you know, you tend to relate to, uh, you know, your own type a lot of times, just people do, it's just natural. And so, you know, um, you know, so you can bring all kinds of types in, but the director ultimately, or the producer ultimately picks the person that they want. If they like really had a bad person in mind, they're picking a bad person even if you decide to bring that person in. But a lot of times it's great, because they'll say, that guy was really interesting, let's remember him for something else. Why don't you go? So that's a really good thing. Um, so I encourage you too, when you're writing, to really think about how you want to play your diversity, you know, and how you want to make, let's make this part a woman, let's make this part Asian, black, because honestly, it's so much better, because then you just find like the best, you know, it's, it's you, people are more open-minded when they're viewing it, it's for whatever reason, it just sort of works that way, I don't know why, because we as casting directors, when I get a script, I'll sit down with my who I'm working with, um, and especially when I was at Disney, when I was really there, you know, at the very beginning, you know, when we didn't even run the casting it yet. We were just with writers. 
you know, when I would go through it, I said, well, how about this person should be Latin, and this part should be a woman. Let's have that person be this. You know, let's change it in the writing. Let's change it in the writing. So that by the time you get in there with the casting director and the whole process, you know, we, we, we're in a dialogue about, about diversity. And I think it's, it's just, it's a constant dialogue. And like, good actors are good actors. You know, that's, not, that's how I feel, okay? Right. You know, good actors, I've never cared what race, anything, anybody was. To me, a good actor is a good actor, and you just really want to get good actors working. Good. Very encouraging. Hi, uh, I'm Victoria. Um, I'm coming from more of a, an interest in producing um, and also general physical production, uh, working development. Do you have any suggestions for someone who has both experience like academically and physically on set? Is there something, you know, because we can't physically be, you know, cast in auditions and stuff like that, is there something to be noticed, um, you know, something that involves, um, you know, rather than knowing somebody who's already in the industry or having a lot of luck, um, what is something that we could put in our resumes, per se, that would be advantageous to finding a position on set? I think, you know, getting on set, if you want to work in production, physical production, you know, it's it's a traditional route. You know, you're going to start out as a PA in whatever department, you know, production assistant. If you want to be in the art department, you're probably going to be an art department PA. If you want to work with producers, you're going to be a producer's assistant to begin with. Um, and, you know, I think getting noticed, do you say getting noticed? How do you get noticed? Um, is that I, the question? In my personal experiences, I found that you just need to have a connection with somebody in the industry. Otherwise, it's kind of like running in a hamster wheel. Um, or it's just good timing you happen to meet somebody. Yeah, I, again, I, I, I. Opening for you that's freelance. And, and right. I think, you know, getting in any way you can. And I know this sounds like such a blanket kind of bullshit answer, but. There's enough production going on outside of the studio system, outside of um, the television universe right now, that whether you're jumping on some of these uh, independent projects, which always, I don't care, they're always going to lead to something else. Um, if there's a panel here and you say, hey, you know what, I really want to be a producer's assistant, then Give a producer your contact information. And if something, and by the way, this is a connection business. This is one million percent a connection business. Don't kid yourself. This is a connection business, right? Everyone in this room is connected to all of us just by us being here, right? And so, and we're connected, and we're, and it's it's connections. It just is. Oh, you can only get in the door, right? And once you're in there, like I said, you just got to back it up. You have to back it up. You want to be a producer, right? Know your stuff when you go in there in the morning, beyond what the coffee order is or the egg McMuffin that wasn't supposed to have. Know what's happening that day. Know what's going on in the production of the show that day. Be prepared to answer every question that's going to be thrown at you. Be prepared to be of assistance for everything that's going to happen. You know, I've had great assistance and I've had some not great assistance. But if they're not great, it's okay. Because they go off and they find something else, they go, hey man, I don't want to be doing this anymore. But it's all about connections. So utilize them. And when you're there, just make sure that you're on point when you're there. That's, that, it sounds so simple. And I don't know if that answers your question, but the truth of the matter is, you have to climb a lot in this business and be willing to like start on that first rung of the ladder. And you might be there for a while. And then grab the next one, and the next one, and this one over here, and this one over here. Uh, just a continuation of that question. Um, what if you started at the bottom, and you worked away, and the you know, production ended, and then you constantly found yourself having to start at the bottom over and over and over and over and over again? It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. If you get on a show now, 
right? If you get on a show now and you get in the art department, you're an art department PA. Okay. Okay? Then the show wraps, and they're gonna say, hey, you know what? Walter's going into his third season, right? And so there's the art department. You might start as a PA over there, right? It's not that you're starting over, right? You're jumping to a new crew, so they gotta feel you out, they gotta figure out what you're cool with, and then you get the bump. When that show wraps, you're gonna to go to the next show, and you'll start going this way, and you, you can't go backwards. This business, you know, this business only keeps moving forward. So if you've been the PA, then you're gonna take it to the next level, to the next level, then you're gonna be an art director, production designer, whatever it is. I don't think it works in a way, unless you keep putting yourself in that position where you get the job as the PA, you go to the next gig, they're like, oh, no, they're not ready, or they messed up, they're gonna keep knocking you down, but if you're doing everything right, you will continue, I swear to God. If you do something right the first time out of the gate, you will keep moving up, especially in production. It's just how, that's just how the system is designed. This, this, this system is designed to get you to move up. And, and also I was gonna say, let people know when you're working on things. I know it's gonna sound like silly advice, but say Facebook. Like a lot of people hate saying stuff about themselves. Find a good friend of yours who can go on your Facebook page for you and go, hey, you kicked ass doing this at this particular job. You want to do that every once in a while so that people know. So that when your network of friends, when their friend needs someone to do something, you're the one that they call. Now, after a while, you're going to start getting thousands of people asking you for favors all the time. <clears throat> My advice, if you're not doing anything else, do them. Because when you're sitting home, at home I mean, when you're sitting at home, nothing's going to happen. And you never know. It literally, you can get jobs from the person that you meet at craft services. Magical, wonderful things can happen. And this other piece of advice that's related, but not. So people feel taken advantage of after a while. They keep doing favors and favors and favors. But here's the thing. If someone is calling you and asking you for a favor, remember what they're working on is their baby. So you might think it's some dicky little thing, but it is their child. So them calling you is actually a compliment. So you saying, sorry, I don't do student films anymore, or so sorry, I don't do things for free anymore. First of all, you don't really know what it is. It could be something major that happens all the time where you turn down something that actually was good. But if you're saying, sorry, I don't do that anymore, they get off the phone feeling sad. They were calling you with a gift, and they get off the phone feeling sad. Where instead, you literally just went, hey, you know what? Oh my god, that sounds so amazing. I'm so sorry I'm booked that night, or I'm doing this other project, but thank you so much for thinking of me. You're still <clears throat> turning them down, but at least they get off the phone still liking you. So the next time they know someone else who needs someone, when your name is mentioned, goodness pops up and not negativity. It's amazing what that little tip can change your whole life. Okay. Did you have to Well, on the production assistant side, um, and I've had good and bad assistants too, or less patient than you, um, in terms of them moving on to something else. But uh, it's about the proactivity. It's about anticipating the needs. Not, with, not just doing what you're asked, but figuring out and pretending you're the CEO of the set. What do you need? What could you need? How do you have two of everything? And um, the more you can surprise someone with your preparedness for stuff they didn't think they could have possibly asked for that day, and you always have two of them just in case they did, um, that's the kind of stuff that makes the impression that bumps you up on it. It's the difference between, yeah, she's a PA, and yeah, she's actually amazing for, for whatever I need help with. Great. My, my, mother's, my mother's advice was cultivate. I always say to me, Marsh, you've got to cultivate relationships. So actually, that's really the bottom line. You know, you get on there and you get in the department, and what it really is coming upon you is, of course, doing a really good job. This is before my year again, but honestly, cultivate relationships with a few people. Like, if you want to be in the art department with the art director, because the next job, they'll take you with them and make you the assistant. And that's really kind of what happens. You've got to find out what you want to do and really make a relation, really work at the relationship. Don't just let it go. I think we have time for one. And Benjamin there. Um, question for uh, Walter, like you're a business savvy guy. Uh, as a director, I, I feel like I've heard a lot that I just need to make you know, a great film, a great project, uh, and just kind of prove myself by just literally doing it somehow on my own. And I run into the financing problem of how do I, even if I wrote a great feature film script, spent a lot of time on it, made it really great, if I want to make it myself, I need to figure out how to get investors, people to invest in this project where I've only done shorts or web series before. Do you have any thoughts on, in the current marketplace environment, how indie filmmakers can get investment in a project? 
Yeah, I mean, earlier on I talked about the, the math of life and the Vegas odds and, uh, um, you know, and, and this is a particularly tough business. You know, in, in some ways I feel lucky the business I'm in, in technology, if I make something that's better, faster, or cheaper, there's actually rules in place that say the government have to buy it from me or they're acting illegal. <laughs> um, imagine that in your industry. <laughs> you know, you prove you're the best actor and they didn't hire you, they're in trouble. Um, so, but, in this, but that's the objective industry. This is a subjective industry. How does someone feel about you? How are they watchable? Are they pretty? Are they not? Do they sound good? Those are all opinions. So all you can do with opinions and in subjective industry is play the odds. Now sometimes the odds of actually going in a direction you don't want to go, um, a little side story here, my sister's not an academic. She hates study. She loves animals. She loves the outdoors. I have huge respect for her because she forced herself for 11 years to go through college to become a veterinarian so she could go back to working outdoors with animals, with horses. She now actually uh, takes care of the Queen of England's horses. She rose to the top of her game. Because she had a natural love for it in the first place, and she focused, forced herself to do something she didn't like to get back to doing something she did like. And I see that in this industry a little bit in that you almost need to become a capitalist long enough to go to going back so you can afford to going back to becoming an artist. You know, if you get to the point where you don't have to worry about your rent anymore, you're now at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is self-actualization. So you can actually, why, why am I here? What's my purpose? So the short answer to that is absolutely, do your own thing, produce your own shows. You know, software and laptops, YouTube and everything else, it could not get cheaper. And for raising money, do it just like a startup. You know, you put together a good pitch deck and a good package and good PowerPoints and good videos and good Kickstarter campaigns. I mean, how can I trust you to produce a full movie if you can't produce a Kickstarter video? Um, and use all of the above. And then find someone who has enough money that will be flattered by being in a role, preferably from China. And <laughs> get your funding. Uh, well, we've learned a lot today. We've got some really great advice. Cultivate relationships. Keep your manners in. Keep reaching. Keep, keep trying to leverage your own uniqueness. Don't bring a handgun to an audition. <laughs> I want to thank all everybody that spoke today. And Nicole, did you yeah, want to say I just want to say one quick thing. Yes. So actually, one thing we did not get into. We're actually developing a whole bunch of television shows. So actually, um, when that comes out and you see menu.com on it, um, if you actually see that you're right for something, whether this be production or one of the parts, email us at indie, Nicole at Indie.com. We're also, in the next few weeks, going to be casting a whole bunch of web series um, uh, and shorts with huge casting members, too. So again, if you put in the heading that you met me here, I will guarantee that we will bring you in for it. Thanks to Nicole. Thank you.